And I'm back. Good afternoon, residents. Lunch will be served in five minutes. Our special item of the day, fruit cocktail. Miss Cotty always had beautiful hair. Beautiful. Patrick Pitsenbarger. It's been years. I'm retired. Rita Parker Sloan passed away. Rita specified that you do her hair and makeup for the funeral. The will makes a provision for services rendered. My client demand high quality beauty products. What you looking for? Perfect powder bleach and Vivante. <laughs> That smack don't stick to nappy heads. Oh my God, Pat, is it you? Yeah, it looks so athletic. I'm surprised you still remember me. Who could forget the Liberace of Sandusky? I suppose to make a dead bitch look human. Was she a handful? Oh, a demanding Republican monster. Sounds like a nightmare. I adore her. Holy hell, Pat. You're still alive? I used to perform here. Must have been before my time. This place was family. Girl, you taught me everything I never wanted to know. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I never really knew you, I want you to know you changed my life. Well, ain't you just the sweetest thing? Pick me. Slay, girl! Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the latest episode of the Peccadillo Sofa Club. I'm here in deep, dark England in this winter night. And tonight we're going to celebrate the latest, one of the latest additions to the Peccadillo Pictures catalogue. It's the film Swan Song. And to join us tonight, we've got a great raft of the cast and crew. We've got uh, Todd Stevens, the film's writer, director and producer. Hello, Todd. Hey, what's up? How are you? <laughs> Strong tree work there, Todd. I'm liking your style. Thank um, you. We also have uh, Tom, Todd's collaborator, Eric Eisenbray, who produced the film and also acts in it. Hello, Eric. Hi there, Chris. Hi, Hi, everybody. Good to see you. Now, we were hoping to get Udo Kier, but he's uh, currently having technical issues in his Hollywood IRE where the uh, internet doesn't seem to be working. But we may hear from him in some way, shape or form during the evening. Okay, so let's have a look at a little clip from the film. Udo plays Pat Pitzenberger, who um, is called on to do a great last work. Here's a, here's a clip of him hitchhiking. That rock sure is different. That rock sure is different. That rock sure is different. There are plenty more where this came from. David gave them all to me. And each one has a story. I'll bet. I have a job to do. What's that? I have to make a lady beautiful, her hair. Is that what you do? You're a beautician? Yeah. I was a, yeah, yeah. I'm a hairdresser. I was very successful. When I was young in this beautiful town, I had the best clients, the richest woman. Who was and that? And then, what? Who was that? Rita. Oh. And then my assistant opened her own store right across from me and took one of my most important clients with her. That took some nerve. Yeah, and then my friend died. Friend David? Yeah, David died. And I took a second mortgage, but the nephew took everything. He got everything. I lost it. 
What did David die of? AIDS. Great. Uh, hopefully, Todd has uh, Udo on the line. <laughs> Is that correct? I do. Yes, I do. I do. <laughs> We're beaming him in by FaceTime. There. Uh, this, this will be interesting. <laughs> there we are. Hi, Udo. Hey, Udo, can you hear them? Uh, yes. Hold on. Uh, maybe I can make it a little louder. <laughs> Hold on, hold on. Make it louder. I don't know how to make There's it louder. Uh, here's speaker. Hello, can you hear? Yeah, we do. All right, that's better. Okay. So, all right. Hi, Udo. Welcome. Uh, I cannot hear you very well. Let me sit there. Okay, I'll turn it up. T turn it up. Can you Hi, uh, welcome? Can you hear us? Hello. Can you hear them, Udo? Can you hear me? Yeah, but very far away. I don't know what how is where's the sound? That I can make it louder. On your phone, like on your on the volume of your phone if you turn it up? Yeah, but where is the is it better now? We can hear you. Okay, I hear you better, yes. Okay, good. Great. So, yes. But I don't see you now. Uh, what is this? He doesn't see me. Uh, <laughs> oh, my God, technology. <laughs> <laughs> this seems like it could be an extra scene from the film. <laughs> yeah, basically. There you are. Okay. There you are. Yep. Okay. There we go. I'm here. This okay, Uta, right. can you hear us now? Okay. You can hear us, Udo? Yes. Okay. All right, let's start. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, the first thing that I thought that we could discuss is obviously the Pat's Pitzenberger character is a very particular point in his life and in the generation of gay men. He, I presume from his biography, he would have lived through the first decriminalization in the West of the gay of the gay lifestyle. Then, obviously, the AIDS crisis and the 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 huge upheaval that that caused to gay men and to all of their allies. And now he's the first generation also to meet old age as being a as being a member of an open member of society. I just wonder what you guys think of that and of and of characters of that kind of age group being represented now. Uh, well, for me, uh, when I read the script and I uh, met Todd, he came visit me in Palm Springs. Uh, I liked it very much because it was very much the time of my generation because mm. I'm now seven, uh, 78. And that was in uh, Europe when I grew up. It was uh, very, very, very forbidden. And at that time, if you would have told anybody, well, in 20, 50 years, people can get married in America to men or to women, uh, you would have said you must be joking. So yeah. for, for me, it was interesting, the script. It was a very very well written script and for me it was interesting to go back in time from today going back <clears throat> and Todd and myself we decided that before the film started that I live in a, the retirement home for a few days I think two days to uh, test everything out and then we almost shot the film chronological I really left the retirement home, hitchhiked. It was all real. This mm. film 
is real and I'm very, very, uh, <clears throat> very, very content that uh, I did the film with Todd uh, together and of course, wonderful actress like uh, Linda Evans, which is uh, amazing. It was for me an amazing, an amazing uh, experience working with her because we only had basically one scene, but that scene became so real from the heart, from I guess both of us. And so, so what I mean is, I went. I'm the generation of David Bowie. Mm. Met David Bowie. I went to the first concert of the Beatles in Shepherd's Bush in London. So I am. I knew all uh, uh, these people. And then in the story which took place at that period of my life, it was great to go back. And then, of course, taught uh, taught me a lot about Pat and. The, the city Sindaski, they really liked that we did the movie and they're trying to help. And the, the, the street, which ends by the water where all the ferry boats go to the islands, became our studio. So there was okay. the thrift store, there was the bar, there was the theater. And in the evening, I, I hardly took my, I mean, of course, when I slept, I took my costume off. But during the day, I was in my green suit and in the bar. And after work, the barman said, Pat, Chardonnay? Yes, yes. <laughs> so it became a real, that is important for me. Well, I, I have to say, the importance of I was also, if you have, like the New York Times wrote, Mr. Kier finally becomes a leading man. <laughs> so, what do they mean? But when you make an independent film, which this is, and playing a big part or the leading part, like I did, you have much more freedom of creation. And I had one thing in mind, which I learned from my good friend Lars von Trier, with him, whom I made 30 years, 10 movies, don't act. Don't mm. act. So even it is very kind of a little bit sometimes over the top, but I was not acting. It was just like going back in my past, observing situations, observing my old store, where, uh, the, uh, you know, I had somebody else working. So for me, the film is very important. And of course, I'm happy that I get awards from Dublin and Monte Carlo. Uh, yes, so that's what I can say about the film, about the uh, generation, what it was for me going back in my own uh, okay, I wasn't a hairdresser and I didn't wear a green suit, but, <laughs> but going back in time, how people were uh, handling homosexuality, you know, they were very, very forbidden, the whole thing. It was kind of horrible. Yeah, because the film seems to have a really strong emotional heft as it as it grows. And I think it must be that generational, uh, that time travel you're speaking about, which creates the layers of emotion as you go through the movie. Yes, but that's, for example, uh, my uh, text I have with the barman in the, the bar, the gay bar, where I said, oh my God, where is that, that, where is that? Oh, that was like that, how it all has changed. And that is, that is for me was the important part to go back in my past that I was away for quite a while and realize how things has changed, you know? And then of course, to top it all, you know, my performance in the club, <laughs> which was amazing with the chandelier and uh, yes 
yes, and I like, you see, I like also the ending, the scene with Linda, the scene of we rehearsed, we rehearsed, and then when we were shooting, it was real. There was no acting. It was real. It was real of her explanation uh, of why she didn't come to the funeral because uh, AIDS was all such an, a new thing and all that. And oh, it was wonderful. And I love, I love the end of the film. And I wake him out and he seen all the troops. That was very, very intelligent to do that. Right, well, we've actually got, got a clip of you and Linda together. So why don't we watch that now? Okay. Don't you dare. <sighs> Diddy would do a better job. Bullshit. I didn't know that you looked that bad. Well, then fix me, goddammit. When David died, you didn't come to the funeral. And now you want me to rescue yours? Pat, for Christ's sake, I never even met David. We talked about him every Friday at four for 33 years. You know, I don't do well at funerals. Really? I adore them. You're not making this easy, Patrick. I'm trying to make this right. I know I was your servant. But I thought I was your friend. You knew every goddamn secret I ever had. And you never listened once to mine. It was another world back then, Pat. People evolved, they let go. Maybe you should too. Have a fun funeral. I was embarrassed, okay? About how David died. When I did let you know how much it hurt that you weren't there because I needed you there at that moment. Where were you? I left you. The whole town followed. Fantastic scene. And we've got Linda Evans with us right now. Hello, Linda. Hello. Oh, my God. Linda, we call you Jane Linda. But <laughs> you are Hollywood royal. <laughs> Udo, I love you. Love you too. <laughs> oh. One of the great themes I found watching the film was was how complex all of the relationships are, especially when uh, we could presume that we we understand what people's stereotypes or presumptions could be. The film never dips into any easy relationships here, and that that scene that we've just watched seems to epitomise that for you and for you and Udo, Linda. Well, that was the beauty of Todd and his writing. They sent me the script, and within five minutes, I was crying. And then 10 minutes later, I was laughing, and then I was crying. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to do this. How can I not do it? It's brilliant. I mean, he, he took my heart on this journey and then cast Udo, and he delivered beyond, beyond. It was just uh, 
the beauty, the film from the beginning to the end is so poignant with human beings and life and choices. And he didn't miss a moment to just take your heart and move you here and move you there and show you the best of life, the worst of life, but never judged. Todd, you never judge anyone, any of your characters, but they are so real. And it was just magnificent to watch what you did with that and how everyone performed in it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Seems, Thank you. It seems that some of the emotional weight that I felt was because of that kind of uncommented complexity of the characters, how, how that complex complexity just sits in the screen rather than being wrapped up or controlled or directed. Todd and Eric, how did you how did you feel about that when you were entering it? I've heard you mention before that you didn't want to uh, kind of dip into a, a, a film where people had attitudes. Yeah, I mean, the, the first clip that you showed with um, with Pat in the pickup truck, you know, that was kind of early on in the film. And um, we wanted to show that even though, you know, you almost thought that that woman, you know, being like, you know, that being a conservative type woman, Christian woman, that she was going to maybe condemn Pat. But um, she wound up showing a real profound love for him. And um, and for and, and they had uh, a connection that was really beautiful. And um, I didn't want it to be I didn't want it to be about the conflict about being gay. You know, it's like to, to me, it was sort of like post gay um, conflict and just more about the conflict of um, it's almost like more of a um, the, the fact that things had been so accepted for Pat was almost more of a conflict because it just wasn't the world that he was used to that he was used to, you know? Um, so yeah, but we just, it was more about, you know, reconciling your past, getting older, like having resentment, um, you know, Pat's resentment for his former best friend, um, Rita, which Linda played and sort of letting, letting that go, how anger can kind of like stand in our way. Um, of being, of being, you know, happy and being who we are. Like, um, it was more, more about that and sort of like, how do you live in a world when everybody you knew is like gone, you know? Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we had a lot of fun playing with a lot of that stuff. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think the formula is you've got, you write a great script and then you hire great actors. You know, yeah. Todd and I are very meticulous in in our casting process, and um, you know, the film has everything from our Hollywood royalty here all the way down to local Ohio actors. And you know, I think as the movie shows, like, it doesn't matter if you come from local acting if you're a big professional actor. It's just it's just finding the people to fit the parts to tell the story um, as it should be told. Yeah, that's great. Um, so next up, we've got a lovely clip, which Udo referenced earlier about the, the clip in the bar. And this is with Tom Hilton, who plays the young barman, the, uh, the new blood in, on the gay scene meeting Udo. So let's have a look at that. Nobody remembers me. I used to perform here every Saturday night. Really? What was your drag name? Mr. Pat. <clears throat> Must have been before my time. Yes. It was before you were conceived. You see the stage? Uh-huh. My lover David built that. He was uh, very handy in more ways than one. <laughs> I saw the curtain, and Eunice put the glitter in the paint. Every queen in town pitched in to open this dump. But maybe you're too young to know who Tim and Mike was. They opened the bar. There were so many people I remember. 
Miss Cheesecake. Dirty ankle. And there was one very interesting customer, Harry. He was a truck driver. And he came every Saturday to see me perform. Mr. Pack. Great. And we've got uh, Tom here with us. Hello, Tom. Hi, Chris. Hi, looks everyone. A lot, looks a lot brighter over there than it is over here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, Still Tom, gloomy, you, I promise. We need to get a Christmas tree in that room, please, Tom. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you play the new blood in the film. Obviously, one of the great divides of your character is that damn phone you keep holding up in front of your face, which for a person of my generation is just. Ah, just the worst thing. But obviously, um, your the contrast between your your role and Udo's role is is made evident because the club that you're serving in is closing on the night that he visits the club. So uh, that seems to talk something about the removal of these kind of physical spaces uh, going into virtual spaces for gay people. Sure, I mean. Yeah, like I grew up in a town in Portland, Oregon, which is like very welcoming to queer people. I came out of the closet when I was like 12 years old. Um, and we had like a queer center and I was the president of the Gay Straight Alliance and stuff. So I totally understood who this person was. Mm. Um, this person was just kind of working here and it's not a special place for him and it doesn't have any of that emotional weight that you were talking about uh mm. and it's not until uh i come back later in the film and see udo perform that i kind of like wake up to um what he was trying to, to tell me about yeah uh and it seems it's it's odd to, it strikes me this film that contrast because uh even in my generation, when I when I grew up in uh, Swindon in Wiltshire, which I think has some similarities to Ohio, uh, it, there was a there was a gay bar, but right. there was kind of a psychological ring around the gay bar where if you entered that ring, you couldn't deny you were going into the gay bar anymore, and that's the kind of world I grew up in. So so for me. Even even uh, twenty five years later, the the contrast is huge. Um, I wonder what everybody everybody's experience of the gay scene and the changing gay scene is. Obviously, it's it's evolved drastically over the generations. I mean, I would. Th th this is a topic that. Um that I continue to be, that Eric and I continue to be sort of fascinated about. We're writing a, um, a TV show called Flamingos, which is about a um, gay retirement home in Florida, which is basically like the last um, queer space in this fictional town called Vivante, which is named after the shampoo that Udo was trying to find in the movie. And, um, and, yeah, I mean, it's like, it's amazing that in so many ways we don't need queer spaces, you know, that um, as as um, I think um, the late, great Ira Hawkins, um, who plays Eunice, says um, in the film, like, who, need, who needs gay, who needs the fruit and nut when they can hold hands at uh, McDonald's, basically. Mm. And um, that's amazing. I mean, when I when I went home to Sandusky, this town, to make my first film, it was a nightmare, you know, like we got so much blowback and tried to hide that it was a queer film. Cut to 20 years later or whatever it was when the, all of us went back to make Swan Song. Uh, there were, they, they were having their third annual gay pride festival when we arrived, you know? And there's queer, gay pride flags along the street that I got called a faggot, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, so to, and, and the town welcomed us with open arms. They couldn't have helped out more in the making of the film, which is incredible. But um, so you can be kind of who you are on, on the streets in Sandusky. That's not true everywhere. Yeah. Um, but um, so I guess there's not the need for, for the, the fruit and nut. But 
uh, as much. But but is it okay that all the gay safe spaces are going away? I you know is is it okay because it's happening right before our eyes and that's kind of a big part of um you know what Swan Song was about and and what we what Eric and I are sort of expanding on uh, in this TV series that we're doing. And it seems that uh, there's a link between the gay spaces and the tolerance that you've that you've explored in some of the character relationships, where if the if the physical space isn't there to force people together, then that tolerance uh, sometimes isn't forced into being. Because when I was, I remember the diversity of my friends when I was younger and first coming out on the gay scene was huge because you were just there to be in the same space together. Now, now the um, impetus of people mingling is is different. Linda, do you do, do you have any uh, memories of going to gay spaces, going to gay clubs? I don't think I've ever been to a well, maybe one. Two. I don't know. I been to a destination spot when I was young. It sounds like let's go out. This sounds yeah, like right. I can pick her up. <laughs> yeah, we need to get her out there. Come on. This sounds like when Judy Dench pretended she'd never been to a gay bar and then Graham Norton said that he'd met her in one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've ever been in one. I mean, I don't know. Well, there's lots of time left. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, invite, me, invite me. Oh, I'm telling you, we're going. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm in. Uh, one of the also, one of the other um, elements that I found very interesting about the film was this notion of what I'd call old school camp. So camp, obviously, you know, there was the Met Gala the other year that used the kind of C Susan Sontag understanding of camp. But to me, there seemed to be this old school camp of early drag and early queer identity, which was about vulnerability together, you know, being physically vulnerable, vulnerable in your aesthetic there seems a lot of that returning in this film, which which I found really heartwarming. I see a like in that scene between Udo and I, kind of a mix of this current camp, which is this kind of like bitchy, posturing, mm. uh, mean camp. And then he has that kind of vulnerable, almost like too serious thing. And they really bump up in interesting ways, I think in yeah. in like the silences that Udo creates there, um, and yeah, I think it's so so funny, and then has like funny and then sad right on the other side of it. Well, yeah. and then and also just picking up on on that scene, I mean, you're talking about um, queer safe spaces and why they're they're necessary. I mean, for me, you know, this place in the, that and in the film, the Universal Fruit Nut Company, was a place that was a real place. I actually met my husband there many years ago, and they're still married. You know, so it, it changed my life in more ways than one. But one of the ways that it changed my life is that's where I met my queer elders. You know, mm -hmm. um, and who who taught me taught me traditions and um, sayings and like. Um, you know, gave me taste and and um, and taught me so much. And that that's like one one thing with gay life going more virtual and not having these physical spaces. That's another like real loss, I think, is that um, that that dialogue between um, different generations. And um, that's really what. Uh, what we were trying to kind of like talk about with that scene between Udo and Tom, which I think is just a brilliant scene. And the two of them, you showed that clip, like Udo improv half of that clip that you just saw, which was amazing. And Tom um, just, it was such a hard part to cast uh, Gabriel, the bartender, because yeah, you know, like he's got the phone and it's like, it's uh, nobody read it right except Tom, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, and and it there's more dimension to it, and and the kid really did listen, you know. Um, so I'm very very proud of that scene and the work that those two guys did in that scene. Great. Okay, guys, we're going to take a little intermission now. We'll be back in one moment. Come here. 
he do look the same? And what if they don't fit anywhere? That's how your mother felt. You said she was dead! Hey! What's all that? Regalia for dancing. He likes you. Whatever. You don't know how lucky you are that you got somewhere you're going. Everybody, the Peccadillo Specials. I'm here with the crew of Swan Song. Uh, okay, one thing I thought we'd also discuss, Pat, for you, you've talked, Todd, about how Pat was a kind of unsung hero for you, someone that you saw in the club, you saw around town, and who kind of inspired you, and um, obviously made a huge impression on you. I'm just wondering who, if anybody else in the group has got unsung heroes, people that they saw when they were younger that they thought, that's, that's what I want to be. Even if they, especially if they didn't, if they didn't know that they'd inspired you that much. Wow. <clears throat> um, you know, I think for me, uh, early on, I, I, um, I got involved working at, at uh, performing arts centers and I worked in a, um, like a, a press and publication office and my boss was or is a uh, queer man and you know at the time I it was just a job and I didn't really think about how much somebody like that could influence me and um but years years later 20 something years later we're still friends and um he really you know I didn't I didn't have the best older male role model growing up and I recognize you know now that my friend Dean really was that for me to have such a positive, not only queer, but just an older male role model, you know, so for it to be an older queer, ma queer male role model who just um, was such a positive influence on my life. Yeah. I think from what you were just saying earlier as well, Todd, um, mentioning about how older generations can instruct you in just things like taste what you buy what you wear what what's what's good what's worth spending your time and energy on that seems really important yeah, yeah. i mean like, what what is culture you know culture <laughs> culture is a series of traditions handed down from sort of one generation to the next and um is gay people you know like like in certain cultures that's baked in because you have your grandmother your parents like um, teaching you how to be and how to live. But uh, as gay people, we don't have that built in. So, so we need to get that from, you know, in, in other ways. And um, for me personally, and um, like the person Eric was speaking about, like um, our, our gay elders, you know, that, that this film is a love letter to the generation of people that built the queer community and paved the way for all the rights that we have today. I mean, I wouldn't, we wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be married, you know, legally, um, if it wasn't for the sacrifices those, um, those people made. So, um, yeah. And that, yeah, yes. <laughs> Udo, who, who culturally was your hero when you were growing up? Was there someone culturally that you looked at in the arts or in the creative industries that really inspired you? I was born at the end of the war, and uh, I grew up, of course, as a child. You don't know what really happened in the world, uh, world war. And when I found out uh, when I was 15 that people start telling me about it, I left. What? I left Germany, and I went to England to learn English. And also, I didn't want to be an actor, never. And I was discovered in London, and as I always say, I'm a lucky man. I mean, I'm a period in Germany, I worked with Fassbinder, and I went, uh, was discovered by Paul Morris in an airplane. I didn't know who he was, and a couple of weeks later, I got a call 
hey, it's a call from New York. You remember the man in the plane? And it, it, I'm doing for Andy Warhol, uh, uh, Frankenstein, and uh, I have a little part for you. And I said, what? He said, you play Frankenstein. So I became Frankenstein Dracula. But why I'm saying that is that it was a totally different world, that period of John Waters, uh, and all these people, also in New York, when I went to New York. And then uh, also they had uh, got from that, and he uh, me to be my own private idol. So I also... Oh, sorry, my bad. My bad. Oh, no, uh, Tom, Tom, Oops. what did I just do? Obviously, <laughs> that was enough of him. That he did very, he did very well. <laughs> He's back to his private island now to enjoy the spoils of his of his success. Uh, Tom, for you, obviously, being a younger generation, um, identity. All the all the notions of identity are so up in the air and being discussed at the minute. Who are, are there people in your life that that really um, you look at as heroes? That people you you could feel you could imitate or copy going forward? You're gonna think I'm such a little asshole. <laughs> no joke. When I was in when I was in high school, um, is when Andrew Haig's show Looking was on, oh, and yeah. I heard that he had done this movie. And uh, and I read that the movie was very naughty, and so uh, I like stayed up late at night and watched it under the covers, and that was you. That was and my And then fault. I read about that uh, movie I that weekend. Hold on, I'm t- hold on. <laughs> and and I always wanted to write as well, and I got to read about that movie and read how you were an actor who also contributed to the story and the script. And so uh, I've been trying to like play it very cool on this chat that you've been in, but you, but um, <laughs> you are definitely somebody that I look up to. <laughs> oh, great! I feel like we're on a date. This is great. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's I, interesting that you, yeah, you say that. And again, not to like blow smoke up anyone, but when I was eighteen or nineteen, I went and saw um, Todd's first film, Edge of Seventeen, in the theater, and. You know, it's sort of a autobiographical inspired story. And um, the main character's name is Eric. And I just like, so um, just, I don't know, the Eric, Eric uh, Hunter in the, in the story, I just related to him so much. And to meet Todd years later, I was just like, wow, that film. And I know this is true for a lot of queers of, of my age that that, that film um, just meant so much to just, you know, it's like to see your own story and to put your own self into um, this film on the big screen, you know, it was just, it was very exciting. So, so yeah, I mean, films and, and actors and, and creators, it's just, it really is nice to, to, to have yourself represented in a film. And Linda, for you, was there someone who was a, uh there in your formative years who inspired you? Well, yeah, certainly Barbara Stanwyck inspired me um, tremendously, but there was a woman, Lucille Ball, when I was young. Yeah. My grandfather worked at uh, Desilu Studios and they would have at a park a big picnic and you could bring your relatives if you knew someone that was involved. And I wanted her autograph so much. And it was getting dark and it was the, the day was over and everyone was leaving and there was a long line and I was at the end of the line and I kept thinking, oh my God, I hope she doesn't go. I mean, it would be so wonderful to get it. She stayed in the dark and signed every one of our autographs, which I, at the time I was very touched when home, I had my treasure. But when I became successful enough that people wanted an autograph, I thought I will never leave anyone out. And I have, there's no one who's ever come up to me in my life that no matter what the circumstance, I haven't stayed or been there for them because she inspired me so much by her kindness to all of us. That's wonderful. Okay, guys, thank you so much for sharing those. Uh, I think we're gonna go to some Q and A's now, hopefully. 
some of our viewers on YouTube have been posting questions. So let's, we're just, our uh, producers are just going to bring some through for us. Okay. So if, this is a question from Jane. It's for Udo and for Todd. Uh, <laughs> Udo, are you there? The question, the question, uh, okay, uh, okay. the question's odd, but let's, let's pretend we don't know the end. What do we think would be next for Pat? Oh, you're going to be a question for you. So the question from Jane is, what do you think happens next for Pat? Now, obviously, there's a slight problem with that question, but let's 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 pretend that that's not the case. OK, okay Udo, can you hear me? <laughs> what do you what do you there's a question like Udo to you, Udo. What do you think happens next for Pat? <laughs> Except death. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. You know, have a special the angel like like Pat because he does her hair in a wonderful way. So there, there you go. I want to make a film in heaven. Do we do we think he'll get moors in heaven? More cigarettes. <laughs> Does he smoke more cigarettes in heaven? Yes, but only the long ones. The long ones you see that better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Todd, this is a question for you from Glenn. Uh, which gay bar would you take Linda to? Or which gay bar are you going to take Linda to? Oh my gosh. Um, I wish I could take a time machine back to the fruit and nut because and take her there because that was like the best, most diverse um, queer bar in the history of the world. Um, but maybe, maybe if she ever comes to visit um, New York, city um this place called julius which is um oh, yeah. a legendary gay bar that just literally like two days ago got landmark status um and lots of history there and uh i think that yeah i would take her there for for a few a few drinks perhaps if she's down wonderful that's a perfect Do place it. perfect Do place it. to take right. oh yeah <laughs> and she would be mobbed she would be mobbed. Yes. Yeah. Mobbed. Yeah. Dame so. Linda in the house. Yeah. Uh, we've got a question from Broke Dawn on YouTube. What are your favorite queer films? Tom, don't do it. <laughs> Go on, let's go around. Uh, Todd, what, what's your qu favorite queer film? Uh, my own, pri I mean, my own private Idaho, to be honest, like speaking yeah. of, um, you know, I'm not just saying that because of <laughs> my, my buddy, but um, I just watched that again um, recently and um, uh, it's just such a beautiful film and um, Udo's amazing and River Phoenix just breaks my heart. Um, so I, that it, today that's my favorite at the moment. Udo, do you have a favorite queer film? Yeah. Uh, my favorite film was Back to the Mountain. Oh. Because oh, yeah. Simply for, for the reason the actors were not gay and played gay, which I personally, it's acting. Mm. Not that some people say only gay people should play gay part. That's ridiculous. Uh, uh, you know, it's acting. It's a, the movie just it's just the movie eric what would your choice be <clears throat> um well i usually hate this questions because I, I don't just have one favorite but i'm gonna i'm gonna stick away from a todd film um <laughs> and something that that inspired me to move to new york and that's trick i just absolutely mm -hmm. adore that film super cute so yeah linda do you have a queer Themed film that you love? I have to say Swan Song because <laughs> I love every moment, every moment of it. That was... I think you're hoping for a sequel there, Linda. Also, <laughs> the guy who's my, I call my brother, um, and isn't my brother, uh, said to me that Todd's films have been his favorites forever. When I was in it, that that's Gary. He did the painting. Mm -hmm. 
he, he did it because he was just so touched that he was going to be able to be a part of one of your films. Mm. Gary did the painting of Linda that is so prominent in the film, you know, that, yeah. that yeah. hangs. And thank you, Gary. Mm. It's hanging in my um, living room. So, <laughs> so I see and Linda every day. <laughs> <laughs> and Tom, for you? My favorite queer film is um, Nowhere, the Greg Araki movie. <sighs> um, Great choice. Probably just because it's like, it's one of the last queer movies that's really, really hard to find. And so you have to like do a little work to get it, uh, which I think is is like the whole point of a queer film is that you have to go a little underground, right? Yeah, so it's a, it's a luxury good. Exactly. Yeah, I, I've got it on VHS if anyone ever wants to watch it. <laughs> <Ditto. laughs> Okay, next next question. This is a challenging one, guys. Quick, quick fire question from Catherine. If you were going to do drag, what would your drag names be? My drag name is Lazy Susan. Uh, <laughs> I would just like just barely do anything. I would just be really lazy. You just go round and uh, round. Yeah, yeah. I would just couldn't be bothered. You know what I mean? You make everything within easy reach. <laughs> Anybody oh, else? Gosh. <laughs> What's Linda's? <laughs> I want to know what Linda Evans's drag name is. <laughs> that is, I'm thinking, but I'm not sure. I can <laughs> it's a tough one. All right. Yannick from YouTube asks Linda, have you watched the new dynasty? The new, the one that's been on the air for a while? I, I presume oh, so. I, I, I had to peek at it because I was definitely curious. Yes, I have looked at it. <laughs> uh, so Scudder from YouTube, this is a question for Udo. Udo, would you be interested in doing a sequel to House of Boys? It was, it was uh, also an interesting film, simply simply that I'm running the club and AIDS came and uh, the club closes and I was so paranoid about it because nobody knew about AIDS. And the director is a friend of mine in Luxembourg because Luxembourg is very near Germany. Yeah, I would do. Uh, I would do that. I don't know what the story would be, but maybe reopening, uh, reopening the club and do something different. You know. But yes, I would do. Great. Okay. Next question. This is from Ralph. What were your highs and lows in making this film? Your your best moments and the worst moments. Making films, obviously, we all know is, is for people who don't know about making film, it can feel just like life and death sometimes. Obviously, it's not, but the stakes and the pressure can be so high. So what, what was the ride like for you guys? Oh, I'll go. You take the <laughs> um, Well, the low for me was that it, it's... Sandusky is right next to Cedar Point, this amusement park, which is way out on this strip that goes out into the lake. And um, you have to take a ferry out there. And I took the last one and I didn't have a way to get back. And I walked like this <laughs> mile long thing to get back through the lake. And I stopped at a bar on the way back. And these people said, you were really lucky that you weren't arrested because it's illegal to walk that. Um, so that that was scary, but the high was watching Udo do dancing on the hill. There's, I've never seen anything better than that. It was so wonderful. And so uh, that's awesome. I, I mean, I would say the high definitely was um, the town and the city of Sandusky. Um, that that town just came together. Um, almost every single person came that, from that town and just gave us so much to our little, tiny, low-budget film. Um, you know, 
between extras and locations and just support and Todd's family and everyone there. Um, we couldn't have made the film without them. And, you know, I do believe that shows in the movie because it really is, you know, next to Udo, the other main character is Sandusky. You know, it's kind of a love letter to the town. Um, low? Low would be... I don't know. I'm not sure what the low would be. <laughs> Yeah, Eric um, and I both know what the low is, but we're not going to go. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's, yeah. But, yeah, I but, have, have a good lie. So. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but no, the high for me, building on what Eric was saying, I mean, I remember the day we were shooting um, The Little Red Wagon, like where Udo goes up and um, uh, orders a <laughs> coffee and stuff. And that's a park called Washington Park where, like, I mean, that's the heart of my hometown. And so here I am in the heart of my hometown with this brilliant, fucking amazing actor, you know, who um, with this pink hat on and this like amazing fanny pack. And um, and like at this at the at the landmark of my hometown, you know, like and also that the fountain where we shot. It's like these are the like culture. These are the like landmark symbols of my hometown. And I'm there with with this actor who's now like one of my best friends and making a move in my hometown, you know, like um, doing the thing that I love most in the world. And so that um, that was a definite high point for me. I don't know how it's going to get any better than that. Like, when am I ever going to have like a better experience than that? I don't, I don't know. Hopefully Swan Song 2, you know, Pat in heaven and Pat, Pat does, you know, Rita and they, you know. You know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and just one final question from me. Um, uh, Peccadillo, the people who watch Peccadillo films are, are ov obviously great film fans, but many of them are people who are trying to make films. They're trying to get started in their careers. And Tom and Carloon have always had a great hand in supporting new filmmakers. I just wondered, as all of you have had such experience, both um, on screen and off, and just just in the industry, what kind of advice can you offer uh, to those people who are just starting out in in this majorly changing industry that we all work in? Uh, I, I think to make movies, if you want to make movies, and especially in our modern time, it's so easy, even with your uh, with your telephone, to make a movie. And, you know, anybody who is intelligent can see that if somebody has talent in uh, five or six minutes, if I see a movie or somebody wants to work with me, not only talking and writing, uh, reading scripts, but I can see a film of 10 minutes and I know if the person has talent, it's the way how do you see things and the way what is important. For example, for me, I was never before in Sinaski, but it became like a studio. It was everything was overwhelming, overwhelmingly big. Theater across the street uh, was the Swift store, the bar next door, the restaurant on the corner. It became a, 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 a studio. And if somebody wants to make movie, just take your camera and see interesting things. You know, it's like I collect modern art all my life and uh, from all over wherever I am. And, you know, I can see sometimes I see something, I like it, I buy it, or I get it as a gift. And then other friends of mine just say, what is this? I say, okay, you don't see it, forget about it. So that is... That is uh, the advice for, uh, you know, not, every, not anybody, everybody can be David Lynch uh, or, or Lars von Trier. They all had their started also at one point and the people liked it and they continue making movies. Great. That's great advice. Thank you. Yeah. I, yeah, I was basically going to say, and just to go off that, is to self-create, you know, mm -hmm. write, paint, produce, whatever whatever it is that 
you can do. Do it on the weekend with your friends and collaborate. I think that's the other thing is yeah. find friends, find people that you love being around and working with and, and just get it together. You know, you've got your iPhone, you've got, you've got people, you can do it. Great. Okay. We're about out of time now, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you to Todd and uh, Udo for making it through <laughs> our technical hit. Yeah, a bit of romance for Udo there. Uh, thanks to the PFI for supporting us. Next time, in two weeks' time, Sofa Club will be back with the film 1985 by Yan Ten. And Corey Mike Smith will be joining Alexis Gregory. He'll be hosting that week. Um, and that will be on December 20th. Uh, but until then... Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Cheers, Thank guys. You. Right. Bye. Bye. Bye, Chris. Bye. Thank you, Piccadilla. We love you. Bye. Bye. Christmas wasn't the same without you. I'm really glad you made it back this year. I want to apologize to you for, uh, you know, being able to come to New York to visit me. I know you're really bummed about that. <laughs> you left home just as soon as you could. You couldn't have left any faster. You don't even talk to your own family anymore. So stop telling me what I should do. I spoke with Carly, and I think she's still on the market. So then why did you call me today? Why are we doing this? I just want to see you one last time. I've lost so many friends. Dear Father, we want to thank you for allowing us to spend this Christmas together. We pray that there are many more days like this to come, many more memories for us to look forward to. We pray that you'll continue to teach us how to love each other unconditionally, just the way that you love us. We pray that your everlasting grace continues to lead and inspire us.